Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. There we go. Or just type in Ruth in your browser. Makes it easy. It says this in Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem of Judah, and they went to Moab, and they lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left there with her two sons. Not so bad, but bad, but not so bad. She's left there with her two sons. They married Moabite women one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they lived there for about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Well, it just went from bad to real bad. And when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her two daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. And with her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness. So she wants God to show kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. And may the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. Get away from me. There's nothing else I can give you. And she kissed them goodbye and weeps aloud and says, We will go back with you to your people. And Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? I'm not going to have any more sons who you can marry. Go home. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grow up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Whose hand turned against her? And at this they wept aloud. This is a moment. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister's going back to her people and her gods go back with her. And Ruth said, don't make me leave or turn back. For where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me if death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So they come back to Bethlehem, and when they arrive in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman saw this woman who left in such grace and peace and wealth and prosperity. Her name, Naomi, her name means pleasant. They say, oh, can that be Naomi? And she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Who? Look at someone and say, the Almighty. This matters. And I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the harvest was beginning. Father, we thank you for your word. It's unchanging, transforming, it's life-giving, it's it's the word that never returns void. I pray that through your word you speak to your people, those who might be in a place of transition, those who might be in a desperate situation. Lord, give them the faith today to declare you are almighty. Father, we bless you today. Through your word, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat in the presence of the Lord. My message today is titled, When You Are At The End Of Your Rope, Remember Who's Holding The Other Side. Let me say it again. When you're at the end of your rope, remember who's hanging on to the other side. I happen to be golfing, surprise, surprise in a town not too far from here called Beecher. Uh, There's nothing in Beecher except this one random golf course. I don't know what else is in Beecher. Um, But as I'm driving into the town of Beecher, I look on one of the signs outside of the the fire station says, 
pray for the Schmidt family. Pray for the Schmidt family. And, and I'm like, why? Well, that's random. And then I, I, I drive a little further in Beecher, and I see another sign on the side of the road. Pray for the Schmidt family. We're praying for the Schmidt family. And I started to question, why is everyone in Beecher praying for the Schmidt family? Well, on July 24th of this year, not even a month ago, Lindsay, a young mother, was taking her three boys. She was pregnant. She was taking her three boys to vacation Bible school on a Wednesday morning when a truck ran a stop sign and hit their SUV. And Lindsay, Owen, who was six, Weston, who was four, and Caleb, who was 19 months, all died. And I, 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 said, I just began to think about this. Like, us, I have four kids. How would I wake up the next morning? How do you live in this tragedy? And I watched online on August 2nd, a couple weeks ago, they had the funeral procession, and it was casket after casket, after casket. And I just began to tear up watching this, and I can't even imagine the, the, this, this type of pain. And when you, when you see this, you're, they were going to Bible school. Why, have, why, God, have you turned on this family? You ever ask that deep question, why? I'm sorry I brought this up. It's Labor Day. You guys are thinking about barbecues and kicking it, and I'm out talking about a funeral procession. But I, I wanted to start there and ground it into reality because you cannot read the book of Ruth without having that context. You feel so sad for the Schmidt family, but you can read through the first five verses of Ruth and never have another thought, oh, that's fine. let's continue to read about how God blesses Ruth with Boaz. But we forget about the tragedy of Naomi. We're not just hearing conversations going back and forth of people who are just talking about life. We are listening to the words of a woman in great grief and pathos and unbelievable pain. And we're looking at a person who's at the very end of her rope. Ruth chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 is one of the worst passages in all of scripture. It's the most da- one of the most daunting scriptures in all of the Bible. The only passage that might be worse might be Job. (laughs) Some things in Job might be worse, but these four verses are the worst because it shows us something, folks, that in five verses you can lose everything. In a short amount of time, everything could fall apart. And this is a defining moment in the life of a young lady named Naomi. And the Bible sorts to set us up in order for us to consider the choices that we make. I want you to write this down. This is not deep teaching. It's not lofty. Everyone can grasp this, but your choices have consequences. Let me say it one more time, because some of you all are like, what does he mean? Your choices have consequences. See, the book of Ruth, let's start right here. It starts by giving us a description of the times they're living in. The Bible says, in the days of of the judges, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. It says, in the days of the judges. The writer is not just telling us, like, oh, in the days of the judges, like, oh, such and such began. They're trying to give us the whole background and a theological description of the character and the mood of the city and the times that they are living in just by saying in the days of the judges. And we've, we did a series not too long ago on the book of Judges. You can go to freechurch.org and look at some of those past sermons on Judges. But if you go back, you will find that everyone during that time did what was right in their own eyes. They did what was right in their own eyes Because there was no king in the land. So everyone became a king unto themselves. And when that happened, here was the cycle. People, God's people would rebel. God would come in and judge the people. The people would repent. And then God would send a deliverer to save. How many people remember that from from judges? 
They would rebel. God would judge. They would repent. God would save. But one of the things, if you step back from Judges and you look at the whole book as a whole, it's a continual downward spiral. From the first judge, Othniel, who was squeaky clean, all the way down to the last judge, Samson, who, well, Samson, Samson was a hot mess. He just was messed up. But the nation had become just as bad as the previous nations that lived there that God expelled from the land when he brought them in there. So their disobedience during this time caused God's justice to be upon the land. So there was a famine in the land because of the people's disobedience. And Elimelech stands up during this time and he says, I'm going to take my family from the promised land and go to the land of Moab where the pagans live. And notice the, the irony. They live in Bethlehem. The, Bethlehem means the house of bread. And there is no bread in Bethlehem. There is no food. So Elimelech had a choice. He could either stay in the promised land with the people of God, mourning the sinfulness of the people of God, repenting and waiting on God to deliver, or he could leave the promised land where God is at and go to Moab where there is food and there is an abundant and there are also false gods on every corner, but who cares? We're hungry. Your family is in that situation. What do you do? Do you stay where God is at even though there's no food? A mm, lot of Elimelech. Touch someone and say, you look a lot like Elimelech. <laughs> Furthermore, Elimelech's name means my God is king. My God is king. But the text seems to point to a person who is going to do what is right in his own eyes no matter what. And so his family's facing a famine, so he decides to go to the pagan city of Moab with his family, and that's the choice that he made. How do we make decisions when we are faced with a defining moment in our lives? How do you make a decision when everything is on the line? I would suggest to you that most of us, the heaviest factors in the decisions that we make are the, are, are the ones that speak to our comfort and our stability. That's how we decide. But how is this going to make me more comfortable, more stable? How does this help my family, but I want to, Ruth is giving us a glaring picture, and it's asking this question, when was the last time that God's will was the determining factor in a decision you made? When was the last time you said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done? See, we go through many defining moments, and we make these choices that seem best to us without ever asking what does God say about this? Can I get an amen? Can I get at least a few honest Christians in the back that can say there are often times in life where we're making decisions and thus saith the Lord isn't even on the table. Does your relationship with God have any impact on your decision making? In other words, Elimelech, is God really your king? Or are you in Moab with the people? See, the Bible says that Elimelech said, I'm just going to sojourn there. I'm not going to live in Moab. I'm just going to go for a few weeks. It'll be like an extended vacation with these sinful people and all their false gods. I'm not going to live there. Of course, we're, Beth we're from Bethlehem of Judah. We would never live there. We're just going to sojourn there because sometimes we, we just, we not, none of us are going to live in Moab. We just visit. Why would we ever leave the people of God? We just go and we sojourn. We, we visit for a little bit, you know, and sometimes when we go to a place far away from God, God, it seems sensible. Everyone around us at our home is hungry and they're suffering and we have food over there in Moab and they never sat down and said, Moab, Naomi, come on, kids, come on in, come on in. This is our new home. They never said that. They just made a conscious choice to settle and wander there 
And it just happened that they started existing there in this place that was far away from God. When you start drifting from God, you never make the conscious choice, today I'm going to leave the church. You just start drifting a little bit. You're just there. Yeah, I know that doesn't matter. This, I know what God said, but I'm in this new place. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in a land far from the land that God wanted for you. And you never meant to settle there. You just drifted for a moment to something that seemed enticing at first. And Ruth is talking to someone who lived in the land of promise. And then you left it. And all of a sudden, in this place, the Bible says they thought they were, Elimelech was only going to be there for a little while. But here's the news. He died there. He died off in the land of Moab in this place. Mm, But here's the good news. Naomi, you still got two boys. Strong men. You got them, Naomi. You could have gone back to the land of promise, but the Bible says no. Ruth and her two strapping boys stayed there for 10 more years. They lived there for 10 years And in Deuteronomy 7, the law commanded not to marry foreigners. And once you've been living, they both married Moabite women. Because once you've been living in the land of Moab for some time, you kind of start forgetting. It's easier to be a little more disobedient. It's easier to take another step away. See, it didn't matter at this point because even though her husband had died, she had sons, and these sons were young and married, and they would be future descendants to carry her in her old age. But both of her daughters were barren, though, which was an obvious sign in those times that God's judgment was on that family. They were barren at that time. And then the second hammer drops in the life of Naomi. You have your two sons. They're going to take care of you in your old age. Everything will be fine. Don't worry about it. And then the Bible says both of her sons died. Her entire world comes crashing down on this woman. She is alone. Her life is one that is set under the judgment of God. Who is going to now support a foreign widow with no sons, no family, no government aid, a stranger in a strange land, an aging single woman with no one to care for? I want to talk about a person who's at the bottom of the barrel who's at the end of her rope. There is no hope. She heard somewhere, though, in that place of despair that God had lifted the famine over in Bethlehem. And this means one thing, that the people over there have repented, and God is now restoring the land of her homeland. And Naomi knows one thing, that if I stand up in the lowest place, in the place of desperation, and I cry out to God, he'll still hear me. Do you know that in your spirit? She knows that even if her family lived in rebellion and left the place and the land of promise, that the God she served has a history of waiting on prodigals. He has a history of looking for wandering sinners, and she knows that God loves to be gracious. How many people know that today? Mm. So I want you to take just a few more minutes and hear the theology of a grieving woman. In verse 6, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home. And when she, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to Judah, and Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's home. Now listen, she says, may the Lord, in verse 8, show you kindness. Look at someone and say kindness. See, this... Word in the Hebrew is a word called hesed. Say that one time, hesed. No single word. She said, I want you to go home and may the Lord show hesed to you. And and, and this translation says kindness, but there is no English word that can capture the essence of the word. The closest we can come to is covenant love or or loyal love. It's the type of of love that is expressed when someone shows you love, but they have no claim on you. Has somebody ever showed you just unbelievable love and they don't even really know you? And you're like, whew. When that happens, that's when you got to be like, hesed. Hesed. 
You're saying God, even though he has no claim on you, you're Moabites, you're, you're, you're pagan. If you go home, I believe that God is going to show you some of his unmerited grace and kindness. Has said, his steadfast love. Alec Mateer says, has said combines the warmth of God's fellowship with the security of his faithfulness. In spite of her suffering, she knows that God is love and still commits them to God. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Touch someone and say, hang on. So then she kisses them goodbye in verse 10 and said, we'll, we will go back with you to your people. And Naomi said, return home. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old. Even I, if I thought there was still hope, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for these young babies to grow up? It just doesn't make sense. And listen to this. She says, no, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. <laughs> what? What do we do with the theology of a grieving woman? The Lord's hand has turned against me. Ruth tells us this. You will never understand God if you're never honest with God. This verse is filled with pain and anger, but it's rooted in a simple fact that God is in control. Is God in control? Are you sure? But see, that pain when you're at the bottom also has to dwell with honesty and faith. That's not what we do, is it? Here's, here, all right, okay, see, nobody wants to talk to me today. I know some people on Facebook Live are with us. They're talking with me. They're like, preach, preacher. But no one here, just so you know, if you were in the building, no one here is talking back to me. Because here's what we do. When good moments come our way, we say what? God is good. All the time. But when we suffer, we blame it on some sort of blind chance. Well, must have been the devil. God is still good, though, but this, God's back, just, he turned his back in that moment. God didn't know. Maybe God didn't care. And so what happens is when good things happen, we become believers. And when bad things happen, we become functional atheists. I don't know where God was at in that one. He has left me to suffer through this one. And I'm reminded of my own pain, even though it was a long time ago, when I lost both of my parents on the same day. And I was walking through the halls of Olympia Fields Hospital. And my brother was there. And my family was there. And I kept saying one thing. I said, God, you know this is not right. I didn't blame the devil. I blamed the one who's in control. You could have spared at least one of them. Because in that moment, church, God slayed me. Eee. And Naomi says, don't you understand that God has turned against me? If you want? But she still says, I believe in the hesed of God. See, if you want to have a really good, solid theology, you must hold the hesed of God along with the God who might have turned against you. Oh, my God. This is a terrifying balance that we must keep. See, if you want to know if you have a mature relationship with God, then in the midst of your darkest moment, you can say, yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. <laughs> that is how you hold the hesed in line with the pain. Because I've gone through the fire and I've been through the flood. I've been broken into pieces, seen lightning crashing from above. But through it all, I remember that he loved me and he told me that he cares. And he'll never put more on me than I can bear. Oh, he'll never. Come on, church. That's the only way you can come to a place of saying all things are working together for my good if you hold the hesed of God with the pain of God. 
And at this moment, they wept aloud and Oprah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. I want to say Oprah just like you every time. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. And Ruth says, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. I have much to say about this, but you have to come back next week. But at least let me highlight one distinction for today's sermon that we can draw. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, left a place of famine and need and a place where the Lord dwelt to go to a prosperous place where God was not. But Ruth, what makes her a, a, a warrior of the faith, we, we have a book of the Bible dedicated to this woman, is because she chose to go to a place where God dwelt, even if it made her situation worse. She went where God was at, even if it made it worse. I'm talking to someone today. God says, see, the text is saying ever so quietly, I don't care what situation you are in, place all of your bets on God. All of your bets on him. You might not see it right now, but if you place all the chips, push them all in on God, and he will make a way. Okay. Let's close with these ideas. In verse 19, they, the women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, can this be Naomi? You know, like, do we know what to say to grieving people? I don't know if we do. Can this be Naomi? Look at her. She's a, where's her family? Where are her kids? Where's her husband at? And Naomi just, don't call, don't call me pleasant. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara because that's, that's a word that just means bitter. You ever had so much go on in your life that you just get, it's a bitter, I, ah, mm, it's a, there's no other word to describe it, but I'm just bitter. Call me bitter right now because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. And I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. And then she says, the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Touch someone and say, Almighty. Mm. I left full, now I am empty. And she says, the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Now, I wanted to highlight that word in the text because we would miss it. But this is a word describing God. Some of you all may have heard it before. It's a word called El Shaddai. The Almighty. Say that with me. El Shaddai. We don't have a proper translation of El Shaddai. Shaddaiim or Shad means to satisfy or supply. And, and the word die means to pour out and to heap benefits and provision and sustenance. Some cultures would use this word Shaddai of a mountain and a movable great strength and provision. So when she says El Shaddai, even though she's in a place of emptiness and pain, she begins to make a statement of faith. She says, El Shaddai. He is, is to, when you say that, it is to declare that the one who mightily nourishes, satisfies, protects, and supplies, that he is the sufficient sustainer. And God, this El Shaddai, is always looking to bless his people. She says, the sufficient sustainer. This El Shaddai is only used of people in the worst possible situations. But it's a statement saying that even if I'm at the end of my rope, you will sustain me and you will provide and you will lift me up. Have you ever called out to El Shaddai? El Shaddai is used only 41 times in the Old Testament. Most of them in the first five books of the Bible. It's used of Joseph when he's thrown into the, into the, to, to the pagan land in Egypt, into slavery in Egypt. He goes, El Shaddai. There's no way he could get out of this slavery. El Shaddai, though, might be able to sustain and move him to a place of prosperity. 29 times it's used in the book of Job. Job needed an El Shaddai. 
Your whole, whole, the whole thing is, die. you know, you, you got boils on your skin. You're sitting there, all your family dead. That's the moment when you need an El Shaddai. And in the most desperate moment of this woman, Naomi, she says, God has emptied me. But if he has emptied me, then El Shaddai will fill me back up. Woo. See, this passage is teaching us about our own insufficiency. If you're at a place of deep emptiness... You're lost. You're, you're far from God. Everything in your life, your job situation, your family, things are crashing all around you. You can be honest about the pain. Maybe, God, if you have turned on me and you have emptied me of everything, I trust in the El Shaddai to fill me back up again. Mm. Did you come here today empty? I'm going to ask if the worship team could come back up just for a brief moment. You know, especially during this time, some of us are transitioning. There's all types of transitions we go through in life and changes happen. Some of us dropped our kids off for college for the first time. I see you, Eileen Day. <laughs> off in college. There's a transition that happens. And, or some of us are working through different job situations. Or you're, maybe you've lost, you're dealing with the loss of a loved one. Or you're in that season of change and you're wondering... And somehow you came here today with all the strength you had and you said, Pastor, I'm empty. And I don't know, that, there's so many situations that can happen that can bring us to a place of emptiness. But it doesn't matter your past experience or your present circumstances. The defining moment for Naomi was when she looked up and she said, El Shaddai. I have nothing left within me. I'm empty. My, there's nowhere else to go. I'm broke, busted, and disgusted. Don't call me Naomi no more. Call me bitter because that's all I can sense is this place of bitterness and this place of emptiness. And I am so empty. But if I'm empty, then I'm in a perfect place for the one who can fill me. And she says, El Shaddai. Woo-hoo. The defining moment in all of our lives is when we stop fighting. When you stop wrestling with God and you just start trusting him. You don't have to go it alone. You can call out to El Shaddai. So I want to take a quick moment with every eye closed, everyone just focusing on themselves. In this moment, if you came here and you're empty over some situation, that you just maybe you're distant, maybe you're in the land of Moab, you haven't heard from God in a while, maybe you're just you're feeling the weights of whatever it is. Today, I want to pray that God will fill your emptiness. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. If that's you today, just stand. Don't don't waste any time on this one, because in a prophetic place, when the Lord begins to speak, He begins to move and He can transform your situation all by an act of faith. All by an act of faith. And the Lord is declaring over this house and over every single person under the sound of my voice. That